Okay, so this is 1 .5, uh, sorry, 1.2. We're going to look at question number 5. So this is an investment question. We draw a diagram. We label that diagram. We make our equation and we solve it. Then we make sure that we answer the question. So first things first, we read it. Roberto invested some money at 2.5% and then invested 2,000 more, right? Then twice this amount at 4%. His total annual income from the two investments was $1,445. How much should he invest at the 4%? So this is an investment question. We read it through once already. Now we're going to start building our table or our picture. So Roberto invested some money at 2.5%. So first off, what do we know? We don't know the amount. So on the first account, unknown amount, X. What's our first percentage rate here? Our first percentage rate is 2.5%. Now we've got another account. So he's going to invest some more money. And it says, make sure we read it here, and then invest it. 2,000 more than twice this amount. So 2,000 more than twice this amount would be, more means addition, 2,000 plus 2x, two right? Twice the amount. And what percentage rate is that? That is going to be at 4%. So let's go ahead and get our total amount over here. Not the interest, the total amount. So if I add these across, we adding these across, we get 3x plus 2,000. Do not put in that interest. Okay, that, that 1,000, uh, 1,445, that is the interest, that is not the amount. So think about it like this. Think about a bank account. Okay, if I have a bank account and I have $10,000 in that account, I only made, let's say, $10 in interest. Okay, interest and the amount of money are different. The amount of money you have is a lot, interest is a smaller amount. Now that uh, $14.45, that is what? That is the interest. Okay, so we'll use that in a moment. So now we have everything that we need. We can now build our equation. And we build the equation from the interest. And the interest is going to be the amount times the percentage rate as a decimal. Okay, so we've got this. Now we're going to build our equation. Be careful with these percentages. They have to be converted to a decimal. So let's go ahead and multiply these together. So 2.5%, that would be 0.025x there. Those go together, go here. What about the second one? What about it? What percentage rate does it have? 4%. So what would that be as a decimal? That would be 0 0.04. Make sure you have the correct number of zeros. And how much is in there? 2,000 plus 2x. Now, what is over here is the total interest, not the amount of money in the account, the total interest that you got paid. And how much total interest did we have? We have 14 45. So let's review what we did here. These go together here. Those go together here. This is just our total amount. It doesn't go here. What goes here is the total interest. How much total interest did we make? $1,445. I'll go ahead and finish this one out, just so we can make sure we answer the question. And then we'll look at question six. And we can add more if we need to. 
So let's make sure we know how to solve this one out. Be very careful with the decimals and distribute through. So that is 0.025x. We're going to distribute that 4%, that 0.04 through. So that's 2,000 times your 4%. That makes that 80. And multiplying those together, that's 0.08x. And that equals your 1445. Now, combined shouldn't have any trouble solving it from here. So those can go together. So we'll add those together. So we've got 0 0.025 plus 0 0.08. Add those together. It's going to be 0.105x. And I'm going to move that 80 over with subtraction. Might as well do that at once here. And that gives you, when you put them together, 0.105x, adding that, subtract that 80 off. We've got 1445 minus that 80. That comes out to be 1365. So we'll just put those together. Now we divide, and let's see what we got for our solution here. Divide them out, and when we divide that out, that comes out to be then 13,000. We need to make sure that we label it so we can answer the question. When we looked at our picture, X, X went with the 2.5%. Okay, so we need to make sure we get both of them. That way we can answer the question. So the 2.5% is here, and that's X. And what was X? 13,000. So the first one that we have is going to be $13,000 at 2.5%. So that's the first one. Okay, so that's the first half of it. Now, what about the other one? What's the other one? Other one is 2,000 plus 2x. So that is 2,000 plus 2 times your 13,000. And when we add those together, that's 26,000 plus 2,000. That gives you $28,000 at the 4%, right? Because that goes up here. Let me move it up so we can see with the 4%. Okay? So there's your 4% here. We've worked it out, and we got our 28,000. Now, which one does it say that we want? When we read the question, we need to make sure that we answer it. What does it specifically say here? It says, how much was invested at the 4%? So what's our answer going to be? $28,000 at what? At the 4%. We don't leave it as at the 13000 because that's not what we want. Right? We didn't want the 2.5%. What did we want? We wanted the 4%. Question 6. Similar again, question six is a little bit different. But question six. Walt made an extra $5,000 last year from a part-time job. He invested part of the money at 3% and the rest at 3.5%. He made a total of $290. How much was invested at the 3.5%? Now, I'm not going to solve this one completely through. I'm going to set it up. And I'll leave it for you to finish. But I'm probably also going to look at question one, just to make sure that we know what to do. So I'm going to do this one, and I'm going to set up question one as well.
So let's make sure we know what the pieces are and where they go. Walt made an extra $9,000 last year from his part-time job. It's a little bit different from the last one. So what is that $9,000? That $9,000 is going to be the total amount. So the total amount of money that we have now is over here. And that is your 9000 do not get it mixed up with the smaller number. Do not get it mixed up with that $290. That is your interest. 9000 is how much money we have. Now, each of these is going to have an amount and a percentage rate. So when we read this, it says he invested... Part of the money at 3%. So part of the money at 3%. Do we know how much money really went in there at 3%? No. So what's going to go here? X. What's my percentage rate? 3%. Is everyone okay with that, right? Some money at 3%. Now we also have some additional money at what? At 3.5%. So that's going to go here at 3.5. Now we do not know how much is in the 3.5%. So what that's going to be is that is going to be the total minus x. Because if you don't know either one of them, one of them is x, the other is the total minus x. Well, what is my total amount of money that I have? 9,000. So this one would then be 9,000 minus X here. I'm going to finish this one out. I'm going to get the equation. You're going to have to finish it. I'm going to get the equation. I'm going to get the equation. You're going to have to finish it. And how do we get our equation? We get our equation by working with the interest. And interest is the amount times the rate. So what do we have here for the interest? 3% amount is X for the first one. So 3% as a decimal would be 0.03 X there. Multiply together to go here. What about the next one? What is it going to be? Three and a half percent. Now be careful with it. As a decimal, that would be 0 0.035. Right? Make sure that's a decimal when you convert it two places. And that's going to be times what? 9,000 minus X. And this is the interest. So what is my total interest? Not the 9,000. My total interest is going to be what? 290. So you can finish it from there. I'm not going to work it out completely, but I'm going to set it up. Where students struggle is the setup. Not solving it, how do I put it together? So there's your equation. You're going to have to solve it. So distribute through, combine like terms, and you should be able to solve it. I'm also going to go ahead and look at question one, because it looks like we're struggling a little bit with these interest questions. So this is how we set up question six. You've got to finish it. Right? You have to make sure you solve it completely out and finish it. Question one, I'm going to also cover. So let's look at question one. It's very similar again. Basically just different numbers and a little bit of a different scenario. So Marty received an inheritance of $50,000. She invested part at 1.75 and the remainder at 2%. Her income from the investments was $925. Find the amount invested at the 1.75%. This is almost exactly the same as the last one.
So let's think about what we've got and how to put it together. What do we encounter first? First thing that we encounter is the $50,000. And what is the $50,000? That is going to be the what? Total amount. Okay? So $50,000 goes here. So we're going to take this $50,000 and we're going to split it up. So it says, when we read it, she invested part at 1.75%. So 1.75% goes here. And do we know the amount? No. So that's going to be X there. Okay. Unknown amount, 1.75%. Now, look at what we just did a moment ago. What about the last one? See how it's similar, right? One is going to be very similar. What went here? Total minus X. So can someone tell me what's going to go here? That would be, you're correct, 50,000, right? Minus X. And what percentage rate does it pay out now? It looks like it pays out a little bit better percent. It pays out 2%. So the 2% goes here. Is everyone okay with how I set it up? Right, so let's think about what we've got. We've got a total of $50,000. So that goes here. And it's always going to go on the right in that position. So $50,000 total here. Now, what do we have? 1.75 for the rate, 2% for the rate. So 1.75, we don't know how much is in there. So that's X. 2%, we don't know how much in there is either, but what is it? Total minus X, right? And you told me that that was your 50,000 minus X. So that's where that came from. Now we can build our equation because we look at our interest. And what is the interest? Amount times the rate. And so the first one, be careful with the decimals. This is where students make a mistake. 1.75% as a decimal. That would be 0 0.0175 times x. I don't know how many times I get someone to put it as, as, as there. And someone I guarantee will say it's 0 0.175. It is not. 1.75% has to go one, two places back, so it looks like this. It's just a commonly made mistake. Students will get in a hurry and not move it back enough places. Then we've got 2%, and that's 0 0.02. And how much is in there? Again, 50,000 minus X. And what does it equal on the other side? What is my total interest? Yep, someone said it. 9.25, wouldn't it? If I remember right. Yep, 9.25 goes here. Can you finish it from there? Does everyone kind of is see how I set it up? Do I need to look at some more of these? Now that we've gotten started on these, is there, is there some more of them? Out of one, two. Do we have any others that you want for me to you want me to look at? Sure, sure. Uh, which one? Sure, sure. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and work through question three so you can see where, where that two hours goes. Okay. Now, when we set up question three, which we'll look at next, Jill is nine kilometers away from Joe. So this is a distance question. Now, what about the distance questions we have to be careful of? We have to be careful on the distances because they can either add, subtract, or equal each other. So we're gonna, when we draw a diagram, we've got to keep track of that. It's either addition, subtraction, or they equal each other. So Jill is nine kilometers away from Joe. 
And they begin to walk towards each other at the same time. Now, that's very important, same time. Jill walks at two kilometers per hour, and they meet in two hours. How fast is Joe walking? So first off, they're going to walk towards each other. So what does that look like? If they walk towards each other, it looks like that, isn't it? And that would be addition. And we've got Jill, and we've got Joe. So let's take a moment to fill in the different pieces here. Okay, so what do we know here? They walk towards each other, and they meet at the same time. So that's going to be very important. So they're going to meet at the same time. So they start at the same time, they end at the same time. Jill walks at 2 kilometers per hour. So Jill's rate of speed is going to be that 2. Do we know Joe's rate of speed? No. So that's going to be the unknown. What do we know about the time? Well, it says they meet in 2 hours. All right. And they start at the same time. So if they meet in two hours, that means each one of them is going what? The same as two hours. Because they're going for two hours. Okay? Does that make sense where the two goes? Because they're the same. That's important. They're the same. And how much total time do we have? Two hours. Right? Two hours for each one. Now, what do we know about the distance? Okay? So the total distance, which we'll work with this here in a moment, is 9, right? So that's my total distance. So we know these are going to add together. Our distance is the rate times the time. So let's look at this in terms of Jill and Joe. Jill's easy. That's 2 times 2. What about Joe? Okay, that's also pretty simple. Rate times time, so that's 2 times x. And what does it equal? Okay, it equals the total distance. And you told me that that total distance is what? 9. Can you finish it from here? It should be pretty easy to finish it from here. But does it make sense now where that 2 goes, right? Because that's how much each one goes for. It's like two people, they meet. In two hours, let's say they leave at 9 o'clock, okay? So they both leave at 9 o'clock, and they meet at, at 11. Okay, that means they're both on the road for what? Two hours. So that two hours goes for each one. And you should be able to pr pretty quickly multiply, move that 4 over, and divide by the 2. Are there any others that you would like me to help set up? Huh? Which ones? Ten. Sure. Yeah, we've got plenty of time, so don't hesitate to ask any questions. Now, I'm not going to work them out completely, because I'm leaving that for you to do. But I can set them up. This is another mixture question. In a chemistry class, three liters of a 4% iodine solution must be mixed with a 10% solution to get a 6% solution. How many liters of the 10% solution are needed? So we read it through. We know that this is a mixture question. So that means we've got our containers. And they add together. 1 plus 2 gives you 3. We need each of these to have an amount and each of them to have a percentage rate. <laughs> Box 3 is always going to be what we want at the end. So when we, when we mix them together, Box 3 is what we want. So it might be the first thing that they give you, but it might go in box three. So let's read it again. Three liters of a 4% solution. 
three liters of a 4% solution. So that's going here. The three percentage rate is 4%. That's what we start with, right? If you want to label it, you can. So that's where we start. We started with three liters, 4%. We are going to mix that with a 10% solution. So 10% is here. Amount is unknown again. That is X. Make sure that box 3 is what we want at the end. When we mix these together, let's make sure we know the language and understand why this 6% is going at the end. We're going to mix it with the 10% solution to get. Okay? When it says to get, that means that goes in box 3. That's what we want at the end. So we want to get a 6% solution. So the 6% goes there, right? Because that is what we want at the end. Now remember, these are going to add across, right? 1 plus 2 gives you 3. So that's going to be adding across x plus 3 there. Okay, so those are going to add across. Now, what does our equation look like? Okay. Just like we did earlier when we talked about the interest, amount times rate. Pure is basically the same thing as the distance and as the interest rate. Pure, again, is the amount times the rate. So what do we have in our first container? Three for the amount, four percent. So that's, and you can write them in either order, because remember, multiplication is community, so order does not matter. So three times 0 0.04, that's your first piece. We're going to add that to 10 percent, so that's 0 0.1 times the x there, and what does that give you out now on box 3? On the right-hand side, that is 6%, so that's 0 0.06, and how much is in there? x plus 3. And you can finish it from here. Is that starting to make more sense on how to set them up? Do I need to set up another one? Do you want me to set up another one? Is there another one you'd like me to set up? We've got plenty of time because one three is a very short section today. Any others you'd like me to look at and set up? Okay. Hopefully that makes sense in your homework. And I'm going to pick up one, two next class period. So make sure you have that finished for next class period. And so on Thursday, I'll pick up one, two. Okay. If we don't have any other questions, then we'll move on. And we're going to look at 1.3. And 1.3 is very easy, but it's new. It's new material. Okay, so 1.3 is going to be new material. It's something you probably have not seen before, but it is very, very easy. I think it's one of the easiest sections in this course, as long as you're careful and understand the terminology. In your previous courses, if you had something like this, the square root of negative 4, in previous courses, you said this is not a real number. Right? So in previous courses, you said that's not a real number, okay? Well, if it's not a real number, what is it? 
Well, we need a new definition. So in, in intermediate and elementary, a lot of times if you try to take the square root of a negative number, you said it's not a real number, right? And we moved on. We need a definition for what it is so we can work with it. This is college algebra, so we add a little bit more. Now we need our definition. And our first definition that we need, there's only two of them, is i is the square root of negative 1. So this is a definition that we need to make sure we know. This is one of two definitions. So now, when we look at the square root of negative 4, okay, we can break this up. What's the square root of 4? Can someone tell me what's the square root of 4? Square root of 4 is, of course, 2. Right Now, there's a negative underneath, so that negative is going to come out as an i. And we put the i at the end. So when we talk about the square root of a negative number, it comes out as imaginary. And we put the i at the end. Okay, let's do a couple more of these and then we'll classify them. So I want to make sure we understand a little bit about these numbers, what they are, and then we'll actually work more with them. So let's do another one just to make sure. Here's a commonly made mistake. I see this happen a lot. What about this one? What is a student going to look at this and try and do? Well, they're going to say this double negative here makes it what? Positive. But that is not correct. Think about order of operations. When you cross these signs out, that's multiplication. And before you do multiplication, what do you do? Remember, very first, order of operations, parentheses, square brackets, all of that, right? Absolute value marks. That's first. After you do that, what's next? Exponents and roots. So the exponents and roots come first, then we do the multiplication. So the first thing that you would need to do is the square root. And what's the square root of 25? The square root of 25 is what? 5. Now, be careful with all the negatives. You cannot cancel them out. But this negative is underneath that root. So that comes out as an i. And what about the one in front? Okay, the one in front is still there. So it stays in front. So that would simply be minus 5i. Is everyone okay with that? Can you see how those are working? Now, we're going to look at some more of these here in a moment. But before we do that, we're going to learn how to classify these numbers. So now we, we know a little bit about imaginary numbers. And we're going to learn now how to classify them. So we're going to learn the new classifications of numbers. And the first one we're going to start off with is complex. So all numbers... are complex. This goes back to the other courses that you have. In your other courses, when you talked about numbers, you said all numbers were real. Okay, so everything's a real number. When we classify numbers, I like to think of it as like a botanist classifying plants or a biologist classifying animals. So when we talk about Complex numbers. That's all numbers are complex. That's like a, a biologist looking at animals. All animals are animals, right? Fish, birds, reptiles, they're all animals. So that's at the very top. And then they can break it down into, let's say, reptiles and amphibians and go from there. But it breaks down and then they can break it down further. Same concept here. Complex. So all numbers are complex. So let's look at some examples of these. These are all complex numbers. Square root of 5, that's a complex number. A fraction, let's say 1 half, that's a complex number. A decimal, that's a complex number. A whole number like 9, that's a complex number. 0, that's a complex number. You could even have something like 3 minus 2i. That's a complex number. 
or 9i. That's also a complex number. So everything is going to be a complex number. Okay. The only one that's, that's not is division by 0, and we're not even going to talk about that. Okay. We don't talk about undefined, because that's not a number at all. But everything that we work with is a, is a complex number. It used to be real, right? Now we're looking at complex. Now we can take the complex and break it down. And we can break the complex down into real and non-real complex. So real numbers are just like what they are, okay? Real numbers are fractions, decimals, whole numbers, natural numbers, all of those. Okay, so when we talk about real numbers, these are fractions, decimals, natural numbers, and whole numbers. So what's some examples of those? Lots of examples. Four is a real number. Negative 20 is a real number. 3 eighths is a real number. Square root of, uh, let's say, 5 is a real number again. And notice I picked this one on purpose because look, it's a complex number and it is also a real number. These have more than one component. So it can be real. And it can also be complex, so they can be more than one type. Another example of a real number would be something like 1.93. And things like pi. Pi is also a real number. It's also complex. Okay, because pi is 3.14. What about non-real complex? There's only a couple of types to look at. And when we talk about non-real complex, that means they have an, a non-real component. So they have an imaginary component. Okay, so they have an imaginary part. So we've got complex numbers, and we'll, we'll draw a diagram here in a moment to help make more sense of these. We've got real numbers, and then we have non-real complex numbers. And they have an imaginary part. So here's some examples. Non-real complex numbers. 4 minus 7i. 9 plus 2i. And we could just say something like 6i. So they have an imaginary part. They have an eye on it, it's going to be non-real complex. And then the last part that we have is pure imaginary. And when we talk about pure imaginary, that means it only has an imaginary part. So it has no real part. So when we say pure imaginary, that's things like this. 3i. No addition or subtraction. Just 3i. 9i. 7i. 8i. 40i. Those are all pure imaginary. No addition or no subtraction. Right? Because these are just pure imaginary. This is a minus 40, right? It's just one component. No real part with it. No real part at all. It's minus 40i. That's a pure imaginary. Now, when we put these all together, we're going to make a diagram so we can see how they go together because numbers are more than one type when we work with these. At the top, we have what are called complex numbers. Right? All numbers were complex, so it's at the top. It's like when a botanist classifies plants, all plants are plants, right? Very top. And then you might break that down into, if you're a botanist, 
you might break that down into flowers and shrubs, something like that, okay? Two different types, but they all are all still what? Plants. In mathematics, we break this down into real and non-real complex. Now, we don't break down the real part anymore. You could break that down into integers, whole numbers, natural numbers, but we don't. All we're concerned with is the real and the non-real part. And then below the non-real part is pure imaginary. So I'm going to give you some numbers now, and we're going to classify these as one of the types. Okay, there's going to be more than one of the types, so we're going to classify what type it is. Most of these are going to be more than one type. So here's some we're going to look at. We're going to classify the following. So here's what we're going to look at. I'll give us four of them to look at. And we're going to classify each one of these. Now, when we classify them, all of these are going to be what? Okay. All of these are going to be complex. And then we figure out if it's real or non-real, and we go from there. So when we talk about 4 minus 7 on First off, we know, just like all of the others here, that this is going to be complex. Is it real or non-real? Non-real. Is it pure imaginary? Yes or no? No. Why not? Because we have that 4 in front, right? That 4 is a real part. So it's complex, and it's also non-real. Complex. And that's it. What about the square root of 3? Real or non-real? It's a real number, isn't it? Right? Because it's not imaginary versus this one's imaginary. This one is a real number. If it's real, what else is it? At the top, going up, it's real and it's also complex because everything is complex. What about the minus 1 half? What would that be? Minus one half, well, that would be real, and what else? Complex. So pretty easy on this, right? Not difficult at all. What about the square root of negative nine? The negative is underneath the square root, so negative is here. That's going to come out as three what? I. And so what about three I? Is it real or non-real? Non-real. Is it pure imaginary? Yes. So it is pure imaginary. non-real complex and it is also complex, right? It's all of them. The only thing it's not is real. It's not real, so it's pure imaginary. You follow it up. It's pure imaginary, non-real complex, and it's also what? Complex. What about zero? What would zero be? Real and Complex. So that's the first several questions out of 1, 3. Okay. We talked about how to classify the numbers. Now the next ones, the 4 through 7, we're going to have to learn how to break up these square roots. Some square roots come out nicely, like the square root of 9, that's 3. Square root of 16, that's 4. But some of them won't. And we're going to have to break them down by factoring out. I'm breaking that down with the factor tree. So on these, we're just going to break them down. Rewrite and break down.
So let's say I give you this one. Okay, these were just going to break down, and, and this goes along with 4 through 7 in your homework. So 4 through 7 in your homework is going to be these. We'll give you different numbers, of course, but we're going to learn how to break these down. First off, always just start off with your calculator and see if it's a perfect square, because sometimes it might be. Now, don't use the negative, just use the number. 125, is that a perfect square? No. Okay. Now, if it is, you're done. You just bring the eye out with it. But 125 is not a perfect square. So what we have to do is break it down. And 125 has a 5 on the end, so we know it has a 5 in there. So this can be 5 and 25, right? And then 25 can be written as 5 and 5. Now, when we talk about square roots, square means two. Two sides in a square, right? When you talk about area, that's length times width. That's why it's, it's, it's square, okay? And when we look at that, they're the same. Two sides are the same. Those fives are the same. So what's going to come out as a five? Now we have a negative here, so that's going to also come out as an I. And then what's left over that doesn't have a pair? So the square root of a minus 125 would be 5i square root of 5. Let's do another one. Square root of 88. Square root of 88, again, that is not a perfect square. 88 will break down. So let's see how we would break down the 88 here. When I talk about 88, notice it ends with the two numbers that are the same, so that means it's got an 11 in it. So I can break that down into 8 and 11. Now 11 is not going to go any further, and we want pairs. 8 will go further, and 8 will break down into 2 and 4, right? 2, and 2. So everything is broken down as far as we need to go, and we look for pairs. Well, we have a pair of 2s. So that pair of 2s is going to come out as a 2. That's gone. And what's left over? Well, what's left over, okay, is this 2 right here, and what? 11. And 2 times 11 is 22. And that's what's left over. So the 2 comes out. And we write what's left over. What's left over that doesn't pair up? 11 and 2. And whatever's left over, we multiply together. So 2 times 11, well, that makes it the 22. Let's do another one. Now, why is it real? Why does this one not have an I on it? Because there's no negative. Okay, so we just broke it down. It's a real number. That's a real number. If it had an I, that would make it imaginary. Let's try another one. Let's come up with something that'll work nicely. Let's not do that one. How about, uh, How about we look at minus the square root of minus 162? So pretty simple here. Minus the square root of minus 162. Can I cancel out those double negatives? No. Very important that you don't do that. Right? Square roots have to be dealt with first. So the first thing that we deal with is this. Always, always check, because it might make your life easy. Is 162 a perfect square? No. Always check that first with a calculator if you need to. Because if it is, you're done. 162 is not. How do I break it down? Well, here's where you have to think about what it ends in. What does it end in? 2. Okay? If it ends in a 2, try a 2. If it ends in a 3... Try a multiple of 3 or some other odd number. Like if it ends in a 3, you might try 3, 7, you might try maybe 11, something like that. If it ends in a 2 or an even number, always try 2 to start with. 
That's going to make it easier, and then you break it down from there. If it ends in a 5, you try a 5. If it ends in a 0, you try a 10. So 162, well, it ends in a 2. That's an even number. So 162, right? We're going to divide that by 2, and what do we get? 81. So we've got 2 and 81. Now, what do we know about 81? 9 and 9. Now, we don't need to break the 9s down anymore because these 9s are already paired together. So no sense in going down to 3 and 3, 3 and 3, because the 9s are already paired up. So the 9 is going to come out, and what's left over? It doesn't pair up. 2, so that's here. Now, what else do we have? Negative in front, so that comes along for the ride, and the negative here makes it an odd. So that's it. Okay. Let's do a couple more because students kind of struggle with these sometimes, but they're, they're actually pretty easy to do. Just remember what you've got and how to break them down. Now, I guarantee that someone is going to try to make this more difficult than what it is. Square root of 3,600. Okay, first thing, before we do anything else, before we try to break it down, what do we always need to do? Check it in the calculator. Is 3,600 a perfect square? Well, it is, right? So you don't have to do all the factoring because I gave you something that was what? Already a perfect square. So what is this going to come out to be? Well, 3,600 is a perfect square of 60, right? So the 60 comes out, and what's going to be attached with it? An I. So we put the I at the end. Normally, we put the I behind the number out in front and in front of the square root. So the, like on the last one, where do I put the I? I don't want to put the I on the end because you might think it's underneath the root. So the I goes in front of the root and behind the number. That's where we put them. That's a standard way of putting them. Of placing the i. The i goes in between. So it's in between the square root and the number. Behind the number, before the square root. But don't try to make this more difficult. Always check with the calculator because I guarantee that someone is not going to check with the calculator and they're going to start trying to break this down. And it's already a perfect square. So you don't have to do anything. Let's do one more. Well, actually, we'll do two more. I can also give you something like this. How about the square root of negative 3? Now, sometimes they're perfect squares, right? And, and there's very little to do. But what about 3? Can 3 break down at all? No. So I don't have to really deal with it. But what do I know because the negative in front? Okay, and I. So I'm going to put the negative in front of the square root. That's the normal procedure. So the i goes in front. I'm sorry, not the negative, the i there. And what's left over? Square root of 3. So that one would simply be i square root of 3. And let's do one more just to make sure we're comfortable with breaking these down. Let's look at this one. How about negative 1904? Fairly large number. What's the first thing that we always do? Check to see if it's a perfect square. And it is not a perfect square. So let's look at this 1904. Well, 1904, it ends in an even number. So 1904, we'll start there. We're going to divide that by 2. You could go 4, but we'll start with a 2. 2, and then 9, 52. And again, another even number. So let's go by 2 again. Divide that by 2 again. And that is 476. 
We'll go again. We'll eventually get this down to where we can, can deal with it. 2 and 238. And, and you could have jumped through it and you could have said 16's in there, I believe. But if you don't, that's fine too. As long as you remember, even start multiples of 2. And you can skip things around by making it easier by looking at something like a 16. 16 is a perfect square. Or you can just break them down this way. So let's go by 2 again. It's 2, 119. Now, 119 may break down further because 119 is an odd number. So let's try 3. 3 doesn't go in there. How about 7? Seven? 7 does. 7 and 17. But what about 7 and 17? Can they break down any further? No. So let's write what we've got. So we want pairs. So here's a pair, twos. Here's a pair of twos. So let's look at what's going to go in front. Okay. So out in front, what do we have out in front? We've got the negative. It's there. And we've got a two and another two. So it's going to come out. Two and two. So there's those. Those are gone. Now what's left over? 7 and 17. These do not have anything to pair up with, so they're the leftover part. And so if they're left over, we multiply them together. So 7 times 17. Well, 7 times 17, that's going to come out to be what? 119. So that's here. And now how do we finish it? 2 times 2 is 4. We'll bring the negative down. And what's left over with that? Square root of 119. And so that's going to be as far as we can possibly go. What could you have done instead of that? You could have said, well, 119, okay, 119 has a 16 in it. Okay. And that would have gave you the 119, and we know that 16 is a perfect square of what? 4. Either way, you could have said, let's use 16 and 119 and then break that down, or you can just start with 2 and just continue to work your way down. doesn't matter. You can take out larger numbers if you see them that are already perfect squares, or again, you could just start with the smallest one. But either way, you'll eventually get the same answer. Now, why is this a real number? It is a real number because where is that negative? That negative is in front, so it stays in front. Right, so it's not complex, or sorry, not non-real, right? It's, it is complex, it's complex and real. It's not a, a non-real number because that there's no i there, right? Because that, that negative stays in front, nothing inside, so no i comes out. The last part of this section is how we write numbers in standard form. And this is going to go along with the last couple of questions, and it's going to go along with 8 through 10. So we're going to talk about standard form, and we're going to be using this in the next section. When we start working with what's called the quadratic formula next, you're going to need to know how to write your answers in what is called standard form. Okay, So standard form is this. Standard form is A plus BI. And the A is the real part. And the BI, well, that is the imaginary part. So you've got a real part, and you have an imaginary part. And this is what they look like. About we have minus 10 plus the square root of negative 9. And we'll start off with a really easy one here. How about negative 9 over 4? So I want you to rewrite this in two separate parts, in a real part and an imaginary part. So the first thing we do is we deal with the square root. And what is the square root of 9? 3. Okay. It has a negative, so this can be rewritten as minus 10 
plus, so the sign stays the same, square root of 9 is 3, so that is 3i over 4. Now, what I want you to do from here is break this up and reduce it down. So that is minus 10 over 4 plus 3 over 4i. Now, what about minus 10 over 4? Does that break down any further? Minus 10 over 4 does break down, does reduce. And so that's going to reduce down to be a minus 5 over 2. What about the 3 fourths? Does that break down any? Nope, you leave it alone. So that's 3 fourths i. There is your answer in standard form. So we broke it out into the real part, which is here, the imaginary part, which is here. So we need to make sure we get the real part and the imaginary part broken out. Let's do a couple more of these. That one was pretty simple because the square root, there wasn't much to do. It broke down pretty easy. Let's do at least one, maybe two more, and then we'll move on to the next section. And again, we want to write in standard form. We're going to write this in standard form. Now you may have to break up some, some of the square roots. So I want you to write this one in standard form. So the first thing we do is we start with our square root. And 12 is not a perfect square, but 12 does break down. So 4 and 3. 4 breaks down into 2 and 2. So now we can rewrite this as minus 8 minus. We have a perfect square of 4, which is 2 and 2. So that 2 is going to come out. We had a negative, so that comes out. And what's left over? It doesn't have a pair, the 3. And that is all over what? 6. We're almost done. To get our final answer, you've got to put it, or got, got to separate it out into two different fractions and then reduce. And I picked this one on purpose to show you a commonly made mistake. So let's, let's reduce this down as far as we can go. 8 over 6. Well, that's going to reduce down, right? It's a negative, and 8 over 6, they both have a 2 in common. So that's going to reduce down to be 4 over 3. No problem there. We still have our negative. Can the 3 and the 6 cancel out? No. Why not? Because a 3 is where? Underneath that square root, right? So it can't cancel with that. But the 2 is out in front. So this 2 and this 6, those can reduce down. Okay. So we still have the square root of 3 left over. And what about the 2 and the 6? Well, that can reduce down to be a 3. Okay. We still have our i. And you can put the i in front if you want. Um, a lot of times when we have a fraction, though, we can put the i at the end. And you can either put it in front, that's a common way to write them, or at the end when you have a fraction. Why can it not cancel out those threes? Because one of them is underneath the root, one of them is not. So this is not going to break down any further. And this is in what's called standard form. That's as far as you can go. Okay, the 2 went into the 6 because if I look at the 2 and the 6, what does 2 over 6 reduce down into? Yep, 1 third, yep. And then we don't necessarily need to put it there, but there is actually a 1 there, right? So I separated out 2 6, and that left me with a 1 third. And then we've got the 3s can't cancel, so that square root comes down. We don't have to put the 1 there. We normally don't put the 1 there. But there is actually a 1, and that's where it came from. It came from that. 
Let's do one more. And then we'll cover a, a small part of the next section. So let's look at one more of these. And I'll make sure it looks like the homework here. How about we do this one? How about, um, again, same directions, write in standard form. About we have seven minus the square root of minus three over fourteen, and this can happen too. Not always will the square roots break down. This one, that that three is not going to break down any further. But we do know that the negative is going to come out as an odd. So let's rewrite it, and then we'll split it up, and then we'll reduce. So that's going to be 7 minus, from here, goes here, right? Make sure you know what goes where. This negative comes out as an i, square root of 3, and that's going to be over 14. Now, split it up and reduce. You can't leave it as it is on these complex numbers. You have to split them up. Part of it's going to reduce down because 7 over 14, well, that's going to reduce down to a half, you want it? So the half comes out. Now, what about this? Does this reduce at all? No. Nothing comes out, right? Nothing can reduce. So that would just be left as the square root of 3 over 14. And you can either put the i in front or the i behind. On the fractions, it really doesn't matter. I normally will put the i at the end if it's a fraction like that. But if you put it in front, that's okay too. We're going to be using this today in the next section when we move on to 1, 4. And we're only going to cover a little bit of 1, 4 today and we'll finish it up on Thursday, at least part of it. So just so you kind of know what the calendar is going to be, so today we're going to work a little bit in 1-4, okay? Tuesday, when we come back, or not Tuesday, but uh, Thursday, we're going to finish up mostly, hopefully, 1-4. Tuesday, when we come back after the weekend, we're going to review for our exam, and our first exam is going to be not this Thursday, but next Thursday. Okay, so you've got about a week and a half before our first exam. So let's go ahead now and look at a small part of 1-4. And we're going to look at how to use the square root property. Okay. We're going to talk now about the square root property. On Tuesday, uh, sorry, on Thursday, we're going to learn about the quadratic formula, and we're going to learn about zero factor. Okay. Today in one four, we're going to talk about the square root property. It's very simple. And it's very easy to do. And this is going to go with 1 through 5 in 1 4. Square root problem. These are nonlinear, and they're going to have more than one answer. And we're going to learn how to use the square root property to solve something like this. Now notice this power is a power of 2. So that tells me how many answers I'm going to have at most is 2, because the power is 2. Now we think of in terms of the opposite. Okay, so what's the opposite of a square? Well, the opposite of a square would be a square root, right? So how do you get rid of a square root? A square. So a square and a square root is, are opposites of each other. So how do I get rid of that square to make it just x by itself? Well, I need to take a square root. Now, the only thing that we need to remember is whenever you take a square root, 
That makes a plus or minus. So when you take a square root, add a plus or minus. So we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to take our square root, okay, both sides. And whenever you take a square root, you've got to remember to add in that plus or minus. So the square and the square root, those cancel, and that leaves you with an x. And what's the square root of 25 here? 5. So that's going to come out as x equals plus or minus 5. And you can leave it just like this, or you can write this as x equals 5 and x equals a negative 5. So you can either leave it like this, or you can break it down into those two. Either way, they're the same. Now the important part to remember is whenever you take a square root, you have to add in that plus or minus. When you get rid of a square, that induces plus or minus with the square root. So let's do another one. So let's, let's solve this one using the square root property. So the first thing we want to do is we want to treat that x squared like it was an x. And if I was going to solve this, and let's say it was an x plus 49 equals 0, what would you do? Okay, you would move that 49 over, right? So you would get that x squared, in this case, by itself. So you would first move that 49 over. Now, we just covered this a moment ago. How do we get rid of a square? We have to take the what? Square root. Okay? And whenever we take a square root, what do we always, always have to add in? Plus or minus. We covered this a minute ago. What's the square root now of 49? So that's going to come out to be plus or minus 7. And it is negative, so it's going to be plus or minus 7 on. And you can either leave it like that, or you can break it down into two parts, which is x equals 7i, or x equals a negative 7i. So you can either do it either way. You can leave it all in one piece like this, or you can split it up into the two parts. Let's do another one. Let's do one where we have to use a whole grouping square. So we're going to do one more of these. And we'll, we'll do one that comes out to be a whole number, and we'll do one that, that leaves a square. So I'm giving you this to solve. Now, Someone might try to take this and foil it out and work through a lot of steps. But there's a much easier way of dealing with it. So what do we know about a square? Well, a square has an opposite of a square of what? Root. So if I want to get rid of that quantity squared, I can simply take a square root. And whenever I take a square root, don't forget your plus or minus, That square and that square root, well, those cancel, and so that's going to leave you with a 4x minus 5 equals, and then we've got plus or minus. Now, what about 9? Okay, 9 is a perfect square of what? 3, so that's going to be 3i there. Now, we do need to solve this, so we do need to finish it and solve it for x. So we're not quite done. We have another step or two to do. We need to go ahead and solve this for the variable x. So we're going to add 5 to each side. And that is now 4x equals 5 plus or minus 3i. How do we get rid of that 4 in front of the x again? Well, we simply do what? Divide by our 4. And now we're done. Now it's in standard form. So what does it look like in standard form? Well, it looks like x equals 5 fourths plus or minus 3 over 4i. And that is in 
standard form. And again, you can leave it like this, or you can split it up into the two answers. Either way is fine, because you could split this up into 5 fourths plus 3 over 4.